If you have your Bibles, you open them to Genesis, looking at 2 4. Now, we're not going to read from 2 4 through 4 26. We're going to move our way through a lot of this information as we go along, but we're going to introduce to you Taladoth 1. For those who may may have not been steady with us in this study, Moses, when he wrote the book of Genesis, he wrote it in two manuscripts. There are two manuscripts. Genesis 1-1 one, one through the second chapter, verse 3, is one manuscript. It's called The Creation of the Heavens and the Earth. There's a second manuscript, Genesis 2, 4 through the end of the book, 50th chapter, verse 26, that deals with Toledos. Last week, I handed you a piece of paper that has, there are 11 of them, from Genesis 2, 4 through the 50th chapter, verse 26. Moses broke the second manuscript down, 11 sections of study. I don't know why, and I'm, I'm asked by this a great deal, I don't personally know why when the writers, translators came along and put it into the English Bible, why they didn't do it that way. It was written to be done that way. But they chose to put it in chapters, and that's okay. But it was actually written, Toledoth is the Hebrew word for generations, generations. And last time, I gave you all 11 of them, and I gave you the breakdown. So if you would like to know the, about the 11 and how they're broken down in the book of Genesis, you could go to our website and uh, check up on last week's message. All right? But I'll show you the first five because we're going to study them on Sunday. I'm going to do the first five. That will take us from Genesis 1-1 through Genesis, the 11th chapter. Okay? In your English Bible. There are five Toledos, and I've listed it on your paper. And let me, let me do this once again. Notice if, if you have your Bibles open, notice Genesis 2-4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made the heavens and earth. And then he, he begins, he opens up now the second, or what we call the first Toledoth, the second manuscript. The second manuscript is going to deal, the, the 11 Toledoths are going to deal with the origin of the human race and how they were broken down into nations. That's what that whole, the rest of the book of Genesis is about. Each Toledoth begins with the word Toledoth, which is the word in the English, generations. Now, if you have a New American Standard Bible or something like that, verse 4, the word account, in the Hebrew is Toledoth, T-O-L-E-D-O-T-H on your paper. <clears throat> That's every other time it's going to be used and all the other 11 times, it's going to be called generations. For example, look in the fifth chapter. Look in the fifth chapter, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. That's... The word generations is the word Toledoth. That's going to be Toledoth number two. It's going to go from 5-1 to 6-8. So let's turn over to 6-9. 6 Sixth chapter, verse 9. This is the third Toledoth. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Do you see that? The word generations is the Hebrew word Toledoth. That's going to be 6, 9 through the ninth chapter, verse 29. 
Then we come to the fourth Toledoth. Now we're in chapter 10. Look at chapter 10, where it begins. Now these are the records of the generations of the Shem Shemites, Shem, the three sons of Noah. The word generation is the word Toledoth. That's going to be 10.1 through 11.9. Let's go to the 11th chapter, verse 10. This is our fifth Toledoth. These are the records of the generation, the word generation is Toledoth, of Sham. And it is going to be 11.10 uh, through the 11th chapter, verse 26. This is the way Moses wrote it. It's exactly the way he wrote it. He wrote it in 11 Toledoths on the origin of the human race into nations with emphasis on the Messiah, Christ. All right? So on your paper, we're going to be studying these first five Toledoths, which is everything. The first 11 chapters of Genesis... You must know that to know your human history. All of that history, these five Toledoths, is going to take us through the period of Noah's flood and the destruction of the, of the, of the antediluvian world. And a whole new system is going to be developed out of the out of the Noah's flood that you and I live in. The world that you and I live in is the post-Diluvian period, and Noah's flood changed the, the geographics of the earth. And that will exist to the second coming of Christ and go through another change during the millennium, and then a final change of the heavens and earth will come with the fire. And a new heaven and a new earth. I mean, there's no place where you could ever get that kind of history except in the Bible. And it is accurate history. All right? Let me show you how we know it. God does some things that co it's common sense to let you know. You ever seen a rainbow? You ever seen a rainbow? Do you know that's biblical? And do you know that God put the rainbow to remind you of the antediluvian world that was destroyed because of evil? And that you live in a new structured world. The earth is a new structured place. And that the sign of the rainbow will be there to the end of human history. Did you know that? It's a sign. God gave it as a sign to us to know where we are in the history of the human race. Where we are. Where we are in the period of the human race. It's just a phenomenal study that Moses did. And so we're going to do it. After a word of prayer, we're going to get into Toledoth 1. We're going to introduce that to you, which is Genesis 2, 4 through 4, 26. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer. The great teacher is not myself. It's the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit's been given to us to indwell us in order to teach us and recall the word of God to our human soul. The hindrance to that is personal sin. Personal sin in the Christian life unconfessed affects your whole study of the Bible and the application of it to life. So confession of sin is really important. First John 1 John 1.9 says if we confess our sin, personal sin, it could be mental attitude types or sins of the tongue or overt sins. The Bible tells you what sin is. When it does, you confess it. You confess it, and you are restored to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is sanctification. And it's it's a key issue in Bible study, both in learning and living. Well, Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us in the Word of God. 
I pray, pray today as we open Toledoth 1, open it up, we will see the origin of the human race. And we will get a close encounter of the first family of the human race. It's really interesting to me, Father, how you open their, their home and their lives for us to see and how you dealt with them and how you will deal with us. So I pray today, Father, as we open up Toledoth 1 and begin to investigate the origin of the human race, that you would teach us, Father, some things. We are of one race, the human race. We belong to the human race. The human race. The devil tries to confuse us about all that. Tries to make social or educational or economics or color. When the fact of the truth, the greatest distinction within the human race is languages. Languages. I pray, Father, you would Help us understand the truth of all of this as we look at Toledoth 1 in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have, we have studied the first manuscript, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, and we found something very important before we left the first manuscript. In verse 3, in the second chapter, verse 3, Put your eyes on it. There's no it. There is no such thing in Hebrew as it. Hebrew has no neuter. It has masculine and feminine. It has no neuter. There is no such thing in the Hebrew language as it. What should be there is him. Second chapter, verse 3, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified him, Christ, because in it, because in it is him, because in him, Christ, he rested, God rested from all of his work which he has created and made. And that's a principle of the rest of the Bible. That is a key principle of the rest of the Bible. How do you know, Ron Edema, <clears throat> that that is a hymn? Well, in Hebrew, there's no it. <laughs> there's no such thing. You know, a foreign, as a foreign language to you and I, there's no such thing as an it. So it either has to be male or female. I know it's male because of Mark 2, 27 and 28. Jesus declared that he was the Lord of the Sabbath, which is about verse, two, verse 3. That's chapter 2, verse 3. He declared he was the Lord of the Sabbath. In fact, he declared that not only was he the Lord of the Sabbath, but when you read Mark 2, 27, 28, you have a doubling of the bee. S-H-A-B-A-T-H is the word that's used in, second, in, in uh, Genesis 2-3. That's a verb. Moses took and, and did a dogish forte. He doubled the second consonant and made it a Sabbath system. And we've talked about that. Can't go back and do it. If you want to go back and study it, you'll have to go to our website. You can pull that down and study it. An entire Sabbath system. And when Jesus declared that he was Lord of the Sabbath, he declared he was the Lord of the entire Mosaic Sabbath system. Well, when, look, there's only one B in the word, rest. 
in, in Genesis 2, 3. But in Mark, the second chapter, 27, 28, there's two bees. Right? You can read it. If you look at it, you can see it. That's, a bad, that's, a, that's the mosaic Sabbath system of shadow Christology. <clears throat> okay? I know. Look, I know. You say, I've never heard this. I've been in church. Oh, I've never heard this. I know I hear that all the time. I, I can't explain that. I don't know why nobody taught you. I mean, I, I, I don't know. But I know I am teaching you. I am. And I'm accountable for that. So, and I, I can't explain why, why others don't. I can only explain why I do. My job is not to please other pastors and figure out what they're not doing. I don't have time for that. It's none of my business. But my business is you. So we're looking at Taladoth 1. <clears throat> Up here, Taladoth 1, out of the second manuscript, the account in the New American Standard, or Genesis, uh, or generations, the account of the first human inhabitants of the earth. And what God does is lets us, lets us, he opens the home and life of Adam and Eve, and the, which is the first family, and let us see inside their home, their home life. It's really interesting. I mean, we would all be shocked, probably, if that happened in our home and all of our laundry was hung out. Right? And you never knew when it was going. He didn't announce, well, I'll be there Monday so, so you can clean up the house and be on your best behavior. He just showed up and talked about it. And that's in the first Toledoth. Now write this down. Now I'm going to make you turn to it. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15.45. Then I'm going to come back. Because this is where we are in the beginning of all this. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45. He says, So also it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. He says there's a first Adam and a last Adam. The first Adam we're going to study. And the last Adam is Jesus Christ. Well, look at verse 22. Same chapter. Verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Yeah? First Adam, we all have, we all spiritually died. Last Adam, we all are made spiritually alive. If you're in the first Adam, you're spiritually dead. If you're in the last Adam, you're spiritually alive. How do I get out of the first Adam into the second Adam? I got to believe that Jesus came, died on a cross for my sins, was buried, and raised from the dead on the third day. When I believe it, I am removed from the first Adam's sin and get spiritual death, and I am placed into Christ's spiritual life. And it is spiritual life I have from that moment forever. Because that life is eternal life, 1 John 5, 11 through 13. If you, eternal life is in Christ. If you're in Christ, you have eternal life. <clears throat> Do you know how many people don't know, under, don't know that? And they should know that. It's very important. And you know who should be telling them that? You. I don't have contact with all your people. Nobody gives me a list of all the people you hang out with to go talk to them. I'd be glad to do it. But you're, her fr you're their friend. You have access to these people. How come you don't tell them? Right? I mean, it's called discipleship. It's sharing your faith. So here we are with the first Adam. 
in, in Genesis 2-4 were in that category. You remember Isaiah 45, 18? Isaiah, well, it's a good passage. I've talked about it a hundred times, maybe 98. You ought to put it on your paper, though. If it's not there, is it on your paper? I know, I spoil you. And that's okay. All right, Toledoth 1, seven points this morning. Toledoth 1 introduces the period of the origin of the human history. Many theologians refer to this period as the period of innocence. Others refer to it as the period of perfect state of life. That's Genesis 2. This period was prior, they refer to this that way, because this period was prior to the consequences of Adam's original sin. That's AOS. Genesis 2, 16, 17, God gave them one law. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The day in which you eat, die, and you will die. It's called the Enoch Law. Right? Don't eat from the tree. Did they eat? So what do you think they got? Die and you will die. Agreed? In the Hebrew, they doubled the word death. It's muth muth. When we get there, I'll explain it. We won't be today. Muth muth. Die and you will die. And it's an absolute in the Hebrew. And there is no getting around it. <laughs> Dying, you will die. Dying, you will die. And that's how every human being enters into the world. He enters in Adam, in Adam's death. I just gave you the passage, remember that? 1 Corinthians 15, 22? In Adam what? In Christ, all made alive. That's the theology of the New Testament. <clears throat> right? So, when you look at this period, which they call the period of innocence or the period of perfect state of life, it is prior to them committing that sin and the consequences of it, which is discovered in Genesis, the third chapter, one through six, which is in the first Toledoth. This period was unique in at least five ways. It was perfect creation, a perfect creation, a perfect environment, a perfect relationship with God apart from redemption. You understand that? All right. A perfect trichotomous nature. Trichotomous is just a fancy theological word for for First Thessalonians. Write this down. First Thessalonians five twenty three. Trichotomous means that mankind is, consists of three parts, a body, a soul, and a spirit, human spirit. And they were all perfect. They were all in, they were all in conjunction with creation. All right? Perfect trichotomous mankind, male and female, and a perfect state of life, a Perfect. Now, you see, you and I don't even know what that means, a perfect state of life. When you and I think about a perfect state of life, we think about dying and going to heaven. We don't even imagine it here. But see, that was that way there like it will be for us in heaven. All right? So th this was, look, Taladoth 1 begins with a wonderful state and condition in the Garden of Eden, a paradise. And all of that changed because of Adam's sin. And it affects you and I. His sin affects you and I and every member of the human race. 
you're either in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, you're either in Adam or in Christ. You're not hanging out at the, wherever you hang out, you know, wherever that place might be. You're in one of those two places. Here's number two. Watch number point number two. Teladoth 1 introduces four of five divine institutions of mankind. He, in, in Toledoth 1, we're going to have four of the five divine, which you and I operate. You and I are involved in five divine institutions. It is what brings a society of mankind into focus. A society of mankind. The, the first four in Toledoth I've put on your paper, divine institution number one, freedom. It's in our Constitution, isn't it? Where did they get that idea? To set, to set the freedom the, as an inalienable right. Where did they ever get that idea that that was an important feature of the society of mankind? Got it from the Word of God, people. They got it from the Word of God. Somebody paid attention to Toledoth I. In our history of America, where did this freedom come from? It comes from Genesis 1, 26-27. It's called Salim de Muth in Hebrew. Image according to likeness in English. Salim de Muth. I just like that, so I say it all the time. Salim de Muth. Some words you just like. In the English, it's translated that our souls were created according to the image and likeness of God, the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Our soul. Now watch this. Can you write down the apertures of the soul? So let's do it then. Let's do this. What's the soul consist of? Because it's the soul that Christ died for. Agreed? What will a profit a man if he gain the whole world and what? And lose his own soul, right? What would a profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? Soul is of great value. You know why? Because it was made according to the likeness and image of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is really important. Now here's the soul. Here's the soul. Self-consciousness. Self-consciousness. Self-consciousness is so important because it is the awareness. Now, this part, you know, it's the awareness of yourself. You can see the little kid, can't you? A little baby. And especially when they become toddlers, uh, it becomes the me world, right? You have kids? You've probably forgotten it then because now you're in the teen world or something, and that's now you're back to it in a larger scale, aren't you? You're back to the me world. They're just driving cars. Right? They're driving cars rather than running around falling all over the place. But it, it's the me world, the self-conscious awareness of oneself. I mean, how do, how, you know, you know, how, how do you know you're still not sleeping? How, how do you know you're, you know you're not still in bed dreaming this? Do you know that the Bible, when it refers to a, a, a believer who dies, they refer to it as sleep? Did you know that? They refer to it as sleep. Do you know why? Because in deep sleep, it's the closest to death. You're, at, you're, you're standing at the very edge, at the very door of death. Did you know that? Deep sleep. 
And that's how you get your whole, your whole body and spirit get refueled. Did you know that? Yeah, what? Isn't that something? So the, the Bible refers to Christians who die, they, it, they refer to as sleep. Do you know that when a believer dies, it's no different than going to sleep and waking up and he's in, and he's in heaven? All he does is fall asleep and he's in heaven. Just like you wake up and you go like, oh, shoot, I, w I should have cleaned that before I went to bed night. Now I got to do it first thing this morning. You know, I got to clean up everything. You don't have that. When you die, it'll be just like when you went to sleep and hit deep sleep and got that wonderful rest for your soul. There you are in heaven. That's all there is to it. Did you know that? If you think death is going to be some kind of terrible thing, it won't be no matter what method you die. Because you'll shut your eyes and you'll step from time and eternity and it don't matter what you step from. It don't matter if you was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace and got to step out of it. <laughs> it wouldn't matter because you're going to step into the presence of God one way or the other, dear heart. One way or the other. The fiery furnace is not the issue your relationship with God Almighty through Jesus Christ is everything. And the rest of it is just drapes and paint. Did you know that? Employment is found in our, in, in this, in, in uh, Call of Doth 1, Genesis, the second chapter, 9, 8, 9, and 15. Employment is discussed. Adam, Adam was told to cultivate the garden. That's employment. Three, marriage. Marriage is found in Toledoth 1. We'll study marriage. Genesis 2, 18 through 21. I find it interesting that the key to marriage is God looked at Adam and said it's not good for him to be alone. There are not many times you'll find the Bible say, when God says it's not good. <laughs> but you should pay attention what he does. He says it's not good that Adam should be alone. So I'm going to give him another human. He had all the animals, he was naming them, and he was a busy guy. It wasn't like he didn't have a good job. And it wasn't like he, you know, wasn't a busy guy. And it didn't say he was lonely. He said he was alone. Isn't that interesting? One of the keys to marrying the person you marry is that you can't imagine your life without that person there. I didn't get married because I was lonely. I married because I couldn't imagine being with anybody else in my life but Jane. I mean, I just couldn't imagine living without Jane in my life. Now, I didn't know how she felt about it at that time. <laughs> but I know how I felt about it. And the more I went with her, the more I wanted to be with her. And I just could not imagine I then knew what it meant to be alone. I wasn't lonely. I was dating. I was full of going to school, dating, working a full-time job. I was like most of the kids of my day until I met Jane. And I realized I was alone. If you'd have asked me a month before I met Jane, are, are you alone? I don't want, are you kidding? I mean, my wife, I didn't have enough room. I just, I ain't got time for anything. What are you talking about? I met Jane. And the more I went with Jane, the more I wanted to be with Jane. 
That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that he was alone. Not lonely. He was alone. And then it tells you something interesting in his ceremony. It says, and for this reason, you should leave your parental people and cleave to the person you're going to marry. Leave and cleave. Not cleavage now. Leave and cleave. So I have to distinguish some of those things for you. Isn't that interesting? Listen, did they, listen, did Adam and Eve have fathers and mothers? They didn't have belly buttons. That might, might be a gate question. Yeah, they didn't have that. They didn't have it. So I find out, we'll talk about that when we get there. And then family life. In Genesis 128, it's introduced in the fourth chapter one, is reality. And I find this interesting. You know what he, you know what he tells him in, in the first chapter, verse 28? Now, they had no idea what all that would mean, I'm sure. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And Eve looks at Adam, and Adam looks at Eve, and, sa and Eve and says, I wonder how this is going to work. And she said, well, I was thinking the same thing. Are we going to split up? Are you going to have a few and I'm going to have a few? I mean, that's the way society talks today, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, the men, they can have some babies if they want them, and the girls, they can have some babies. The, the ladies, I think, would swap off on that a little bit, wouldn't you, girls? The guys would never take it. We, you wouldn't have one more than one baby in a family if the guys had to do it. I mean, we can't stand kidney stones. Don't put a baby in there. Well, anyhow, it's just interesting stuff. We're going to talk about all this. I don't know about kidney stones, but <laughs> we, we, I mean, we might. But be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. You know, that sounds like a lot of fun to the guy and the girl. After about three or four of these babies, She's going like, hey, the playground's going to shut down for a while. <laughs> right? At least that's what my wife told me. And I guess that's how it works. And we won't get to the fifth one until we get to uh, Genesis 10 and 11. The fifth one is nations. Dividing the human race into nations. Think about that. Now, we take that for granted today, don't we? we that's just normal business, isn't it? that the human race is divided among nations. Well, he's French, he's German, he's this, he's that. You know, you don't find that as much in the north as you do, in the south as you do in the north. I, everything was eth ethnic where I grew up. I mean, I, I, I was a Hollander. And I couldn't, I couldn't date Polak people. They... I couldn't date. I couldn't date the girl in Rothbury. I, I could date him in New Era, Dutch community, but I couldn't date him. And they, the, her father went, "Lonnie, you can't, you can't date my daughter. Why? Because you're a Hollander." I went, "What? Well, you're a Hollander." I went, "Well, okay. Well, I guess I'm a Hollander, but hey, I just want to date. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to marry your daughter. I know that's what you ain't going to even me date her." That might lead to that. You're not going to be part of my family. I mean, we had, you know, you, you, you went and shopped ethnic. You know? Now, you can still go. To, you can go to Chicago, and you can go to places like that, and you can find these districts. They still, I wouldn't go to Chicago today, but... <laughs> I don't know anybody lives in Chicago anymore. You still know a lot of people. They've all moved. Point number three. Point number three. Toledoth 1 introduced the Enoch law, that is, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
it introduces the violation of that law and the consequence passed on to the human race. I gave you passages like 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and 45, and uh, you could later read Romans 5, 12. That would be good for you. And if, if, you're, if you want to be adventurous, you could you go to Hosea 6, 7. In the Edict Law, he, they were told don't eat. The violation they ate. And the consequences, we'll talk about this in Genesis 3, 13 through 19 later. Die and you will die. And listen, boy, when we get there, you do not want to miss the five judgments that were passed on. Five judgments were passed on. Not only, not only dying will you die judgment, but five additional judgments were passed on to the human race. Whoa. You ought, to, you ought to read ahead of that. When we get there, you're going to enjoy that. Let me get point four, and I'm going to take a break, if you don't mind. You need a break? No, we just started, you said. All right. Here's point number four. Toledoth one introduced the Messianic prophecies. Watch this now. Toledoth one now, that's Genesis 2, 4 through, is going to introduce the Messianic prophecy of the victory of Christ over Satan. In Toledoth 1, God gives us a promise of victory over Satan in Christ. Isn't that, par isn't that powerful? Listen to this. Genesis 3.15. This is called proto-evangelism or the first gospel in the Bible. All right. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the hill. This is part of that judgment. Beyond dying, you will die. There are five judgments. Dying, you will die is one. And there's five judgments besides that one given. One of those five is directed towards Satan. Genesis 3.15 is directed towards Satan. So here's how you should understand this. I, God, will put enmity, hostility, between you and the woman, Satan and the woman. You know that? You know that team? That team didn't work out good, did it? That team didn't work out. Between your seed, Satan's seed, and her seed, he, her seed, Christ, her seed is Christ, write this down, Galatians 3.16. That's her seed. Christ is her seed. We know it from this prophecy. He, Christ, shall bruise you, Satan, on the head, and you, Satan, shall bruise him on the heel. In other words, what's going to happen to Satan is fatal. What, Satan's, what God is going to do through Christ on Satan is fatal. What's going to happen, Satan's attack upon the seed is suffering. 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 And if you want to know how that works sometimes, study the book of Job. Study the first three chapters and you'll really understand it. Just read the first three chapters and you'll get it. Okay? You see how that judgment works? You see it? Yeah, it's important you see it. I mean, who are these players that are involved here? Now watch this. Romans, the 16th chapter, verse 20, comes back to this idea. Paul discussed this. In Romans, the 16th chapter, verse 20, Paul explained it as the victory of Jesus Christ over Satan at the second coming. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under Christ's feet. Did he say that? Well, he, that's prophetic. Yes, that's prophetic, dear hearts. When will that happen? Here it is. 
This is the Revelation 20.10 on your paper. See Revelation 20.10? Here's, the, here's how that's going to work out. Satan, in the end, is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Yeah. Forever. Forever and ever. Look, let's take a break. We're going, to we're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to deal with the, the, the word Yahweh and when it's introduced, it's introduced in the, in the Taladoth 1. It is the word the Lord with a capital L. Yahweh. And he's going to be referred in the, the second manuscript of Genesis Christ is going to be referred to as the Lord God. I'm going to talk about that this, when we come back after a break. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. If you're a visitor, just, it's okay. This, this is home people stuff. And then we'll take a 15-minute break, get some coffee and donuts or whatever's down there, and then we'll come back and we'll finish this up, taking a look at this. I mean, you know, when we say, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we do, right? I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we, it's just um, just a very common name for us as Christians. We understand the value of that. Well, where did that come from? Where did that idea that Jesus Christ would become the Lord Jesus Christ? And it goes all the way back to Taladoth 1. It goes all the way back, where it's assigned to him, it's just a matter of bringing it out and fulfilling it in history. So, Father, we're thankful. What a wonderful, attentive student body in the Word of God we've had this morning. Just an easy group to teach, Father. And I thank you for that. Interested in the truth of the Word of God. And I hope they know that they have to study this. They can't just get it. They have to examine it and study it and come back and advance in their thinking about it as we go on through the Toledoth one. But I'm so thankful for it. Thank you, Father, for sending us to Moody, Alabama, to St. Clair County. God, we just pray for that a great movement of Christ among the youth of St. Clair County and for their parents. God, if there was ever a time where we need a moving of the Spirit of God and the truth of the teaching of the Word of God, it is certainly now. And what a ripe community for that is Moody and St. Clair County. Take this offering, Father, and may we use it to spend most of it on reaching people with the gospel of Christ, both here and as far away, Father, as we can reach to the uttermost parts of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me go back to the soul. I only did one part of it. I didn't realize it. We talked about self-consciousness. Self-consciousness is the existence of yourself and God. Out of self-consciousness comes the awareness of oneself and the awareness of God. God consciousness. We call it, in theology, we call it God consciousness. And uh, everybody has it. In some form or another, the identity of it uh, depends on your culture. We, we've, we've been, we've, America has been a wonderful culture for the Word of God. There are some nations go, they're polytheistic. So when they have an awareness of God, it's an awareness of a plurality of gods. And, uh, and even yet, they're easily, uh, when you talk about 
God consciousness, they're, they, they identify with it. You see what I mean? Now, they take it to different places with their plurality. Oh, yeah, we have a God of this and a God of that and a God of this and a God of that. And go like, yeah. And you do what Paul did. You know, Paul just said, well, here's, let me tell you the access to God, period. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. And let, let, let the gospel sort it out in their life. Agreed? I mean, give them the gospel. You know, he goes into Athens and he goes like, hey, that unknown God, I give him a name. <laughs> and so that's what we all do when we go someplace with the gospel of Christ. But here, so we have self-consciousness, mentality. Uh, I used to put mentality a little lower in mind until my grandmother. My grandmother, when I guess probably she lived to be 96, God bless her. Uh, and she always had a wonderful attitude. You know, you meet some people, they're just, they turn into what they've always been when they're old. Mean. <laughs> Uncensored mean. <laughs> My grandmother was just a wonderful, wonderful human being. And, um, and she came down with Alzheimer's. And... Uh, when she was, well, she got into it, if I remember right, Rhonda, about 90, when she got into it pretty heavy. We thought it was dementia because she would be, one, one moment she would be really on top of her game and the next minute she'd be flighty in her th thinking and then she, she kept, and when I did that, when I went through my grand, with my grandmother, of course she was my mother in the true sense of the word, but, um, when I went through that Alzheimer's with her, it was really difficult a in many ways. And what I saw in my grandmother was the power of mentality, both in a conscious realm and a subconscious realm. And my grandmother, when she was in full blown, I mean, she didn't know who, who I was. I would say, hey, grandmother, I'd visit her. And she got like, but everybody called her Grandma Holman. Everybody, she was that person. It's like everybody called my wife Mammy because she just loved children. And she couldn't be around kids unless she just loved on them and did that kind of thing. My grandmother was that kind of a person. She was everybody's grandmother. In the nursing home, everybody called her grandmother. Everybody in the community called her grandmother. All my friends called her grandmother. <laughs> she was grandma. And um, there was only two people that she always talked about in her life. One was the Lord, and one was her husband, Guy Holman. And she could drop into those zones and just recall all kinds of stuff that I knew. And I could give my grandmother a Bible, and she had her, love, her, special, her special reading, like she li liked Psalms 23, and she had her favorite stuff. I could hand the Bible to her, and she could read it. My grandmother could quote scriptures and didn't know where they were. Were. But she could read the Bible. You could hand her the Bible and read, she could read it and not know a thing she read. Isn't that interesting? Don't you find that to be interesting? I don't know. I found a lot of that interesting. But what I discovered, um, and she talked about Guy Holman all of the time. If a man came in, by the age she remembered, and probably a guy come in maybe 40 or 50 or 60 years of age, she'd want to know, is that guy? Is that guy home? So that was a wonderful thing. Um, but I saw the power of mentality work in a different whole, whole way. She lived very little in the consciousness realm of it and lived a great deal in the subconscious part of it. And I found that to be very interesting.
And so mentality, mentality has two sides to it. Mentality has the mind and it has the heart. And the difference between it is the mind is a process. It takes stuff in. It takes everything in and processes it. And that which is worth believing, it puts in the heart. And in the heart is where you draw your faith structure from. Your not, knowledge is over here, but your faith is over here. And, um, and I found th that standard worked with my grandmother, both when, when she was conscious of something and when she was unconscious of stuff. stuff when she was in another realm, she had the ability to, to, to do these two things. She could read. She could read. She read the newspaper every day. And she would read it and not remember what, five minutes. She wouldn't know what she read. And ten minutes later, she didn't know she read the paper. She could eat breakfast. She, would, she stayed with us a lot. We, we, we rotated her around because it's just tough to keep up with a person like that. And so all of our family rotated grandmother around because she was pleasant. And uh, she would, when she stayed with us, she would, she, she would come and we'd eat all breakfast together and then she'd go back to her room and spend a little bit of time. Then she would come to, I had her coat on and her scarf and she would walk down the hall and there we were, we're still standing at the, at the table. And she would, and she thought she had walked from her home to us. And she said, well, I don't want to interrupt your breakfast. And we said, no, grandmother. Uh, have you had breakfast? She said, well, I don't know. What are you having? And she would sit down and eat again. So it's just the mind, the mentality of man, these things are really unique. Uh, also, you have a, a conscience a conscience of good and evil, for example, a conscience. Um, you know, people talk a great deal about a guilty conscience or a clear conscience. Yeah. <laughs> Mothers have a unique way of being able to read their kids, their kids for sure. There's no way you can lie to your mama. <laughs> There was no way I could lie to mine. And uh, she taught when I was really young, there's heavy penalties for lying to me, son. <laughs> Not I lied to my mother. I might have lied to a lot of people, but I had lied to my mama. But the, you have a conscience. You have volition. I always put emotion last. That's the right place in your soul to have it. Nothing wrong with emotions. It's a wonderful thing. You see a lot at ball games, don't you? High and low and... Me, it just depends how the game goes and how you feel. And emotions is an interesting thing too because there, some days you just quote feel good. You get up feeling good, and the day kind of starts right, and you kind of keep that motor running, and it just seems like everything goes good. And of course it does because you got that attitude. Good. Well. Of course, emotion. <clears throat> Don't let it ever get first place in your life. Don't let that do. Never put it up on the head of the chart. Keep it low in your life and you'll be all right with it. <laughs> Anyhow, that's five apertures of your soul. So here we are at point four. <clears throat> did I do point four? I did four. Four. I did four. Here I am at five. <clears throat> Toledoth one introduced a new name for God. The first, the first, it introduced a new name, Yahweh. Now, what's interesting about Yahweh? Is it, one day I'll come back and I'll teach us. See the Y H W H. Those are consonants. Well, the Jewish language never used vowels. You and I can't talk without vowels. I never could hear Hebrew. Uh, we would bring all kinds of people in to te teach us he to, to read the Bible in Hebrew. Uh, 
I'd have to go to labs and listen to Hebrew and write it, write down what I heard? Zero. I could not hear it. I could hear German. That's, that's weird. I took German, and I liked German, and I could hear German, and I, I did well with German. I never could hear Hebrew. Can't hear it today. You know, people think because I know Hebrew that I can hear it and understand it. I can't hear it. A Hebrew comes on and talks. I never understood any of the rabbis they brought in. Write it down. I had a blank piece of paper in the beginning and a blank piece of paper at the end. I got nothing. It sounded like somebody with a bad cold. They were always coughing and, and, and spitting and stuff. And I never could hear it. I just could not hear it. I could hear other languages. I could not hear it. Uh, I had a professor. I said, I don't understand. I'm doing really good in Greek, in uh, German. I'm doing t terrible in Hebrew. How is that possible? He said, Edama. I went, what? Edama. What nationality are you? I said, well, I, I'm Dutch. If in the north, I'm a Hollander, but Dutch. And he said, well, that's why you understand German. That's why you have, a, you have, a, you have something in, in you for German. And I think that was probably true. I don't know. I could do German. I could but forget Hebrew, and I'm stuck with Hebrew. And I love the language. I love the language. I'm, I love Hebrew. But Yahweh, see, it's got four. Do you see the four uh, co consonants? I just gave them to you. Look, there, it's Y, H, W, H. They call that, listen to me, I'll do a study on this one day for you. They call that a tetragrammaton. Tet, tetra, like a tetra, no. <laughs> I was going to say a shot, like a tetra, that's not, it's four. Tetra is four. It's two, it's just two Greek words. But that's a tetragrammaton. That's a powerful idea in theology. Um, but it's the word Lord in the English. Now watch this. In the first manuscript of Genesis, we are introduced to the name Elohim. See the I am on the end? Tell me what that is. Plural. plural. You are such good students. That's plural. That's God's. That's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In Manuscripts 1, we're in, that's the only name that's used. In Manuscript 1, which is Genesis 1-1 one, one through the second chapter, verse 3, the only name you have there is Elohim. In the second manuscript, the, the, word, the words that are used is Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. And it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ, the visible member of the Godhead. And it's introduced in Taladoth 1, and it's the name that carries every name above every name in earth and heaven in the Old Testament. So, what we have with Yahweh in, in the second manuscript, watch this now, here's what's connected with the word Yahweh or Lord in the second manuscript, mankind, which that's is writing about the origin of the human race, mankind was made to have an intimate relationship with God through the Lord of the Godhead. That strong, wonderful theology is found in Toledoth 1. Here's where it's really... I, I've, I'm really growing to love the writing of Moses. I've gotten where I just like to read everything he writes. I, it's kind of like for you with Paul. He does something in the book of Exodus... He, recount, he recounts a personal experience with Yahweh that impact his life forever. You know it as the burning bush. 
in the wilderness at Mount Horeb. In Exodus, the third chapter, well worth your read. Now, if you're a student going to the School of Biblical Theology, we enter into Exodus this, this week, right? You want to pay attention to this. Exodus, the third chapter, 12 through 15, at the burning bush, you remember, do you remember the story of the burning bush? Quite a story. It catches his attention because it's burning and not being consumed. So he said, I better go look at that. He's out there with the cat, out there with sheep, right? He's, he's a shepherd. He goes over there and he looks at it. And the bush speaks to him. <laughs> go home and tell this story. <laughs> They'll go like, you've been out in the you've been out with the sheep too long. We're going to have to give him a break every once in a while because he's hearing voices in burning bushes. Burning bushes and voices. Well, what did the voice say? It said, Moses, Moses. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what he told him. He's in the wilderness, nobody around. He told him, take your, take your shoes off because you're standing on holy ground. Because, listen, because you're standing in the presence of a God Almighty whose name is I am who I am. Well, what are we going to do? Well, I said, and they're talking to a burning bush. I want you to go deliver our people. I tried that. That don't work. No, listen to me. I'm talking to a burning bush here. <laughs> it's a good read. You ought to go back and read it with a sense of humor. All right? And he says, Okay, I'm going to go back to Pharaoh. I've already been in trouble with Israel. I'm the most wanted man in, in all of Egypt. You want me to go back and deliver the people who don't like me? Yeah. And who am I going to tell them? Sent me. And he says, well, here's what you, what you tell them. I am who I am. Uh, yeah, right. That'll go over big. Yeah, I am that. I am who I am. But here's what's interesting in Hebrew: the I am and the I am on each end is haya. Those are verbs. Of course, you can tell that, can't you? I am. I am what? I am. What's the next word? I am. I am. I am what? I am what? I am, yeah, I, am. I am who I am. And Moses has got to figure out who in the Godhead he's with. And Moses says, I was with Yahweh. I was with the Lord God and had a personal encounter with his holiness who had told me to take off my shoes because I was in the presence of holiness. It's a wonderful read. Haya on both sides of that with the who in the middle. I am who I am. He said that you go back and you tell him that. See the, see the haya on each side is an absolute status quo verbs of haya. A form, a form, that verbal form is what becomes Yahweh. <laughs> ah, that's a, I'm going to teach more on it as we go along. 
Those who go to class with me on Saturdays will really enjoy this. The name Lord God was used a lot in the second manuscript, but never in the first. The I am who I am. Now remember that because this is big. He's referring to the second member of the Godhead. He's referring to the second member of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's point six. Yahweh, Lord, is introduced in the second manuscript as the visible member of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, both in the pre- and the post-incarnate state. Jesus, as the Lord, Jesus Christ is a visible member of the Godhead. John 14, 8, 9. Philip says, show us the Father, and it would be enough. <laughs> All the stuff that he did was, he just raised the dead, and he, you know, he healed a blind man from birth, and he, you know, you know the stories that he did. All evidence that he was the second member of the Godhead. And Philip says, show us the Father and it'll be enough. Right? You think, you think that's true? <laughs> no. You know what he said? That's what he said. He said, look up here, Philip. Look up here. Who do you see? Well, I see Jesus. Okay. Get a good look at me. You got that picture in your head? That's what he's saying to Philip. Look up here. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the visible manifestation. I am the incarnation of God. John 14. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Is that enough for you? Huh? Should be. As a result of his death, his burial, and his resurrection, his ascension and session, watch this, Jesus Christ is Lord of all the redeemed of human history. Isn't that something? All the redeemed of human history. John 10, 9, and then again in verse 13, he says, if, we confess, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, that would be Yahweh in the Hebrew, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now how about that? In Philippians 2.11, Paul wrote, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Yahweh, is Lord. In the Greek, it's called kurios. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Well, that, uh, that, Philippians 2, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Yahweh, Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Is that not a powerful idea? That if you're in Christ Jesus, you are if you believe the gospel because the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ and you are a new creature in Christ, a new creation. If, if that's true, then you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And then you ought to read verse 4 of Ephesians 1. You ought to read 4 that, that just nails this thing down when it says, and you were chosen before the foundation of the world. That's the eternal life conference. Here's point 7. Genesis 2, Genesis 2, where we are, shows a personal interaction between Adam and Eve and the visible Lord God, El, which is Yahweh Elohim. Watch this now. Watch this. In Genesis 3, 8, 
they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day. What we will see in the Garden of Eden with them, in the cool of the day, he was teaching them. I tell you, my nose is the hangover of COVID. I am so sick and tired of that thing. I don't have it anymore. I just have the leftovers of it. I heard, that's audible, I heard the sound of the Lord walking. Right? That's a visualization, is it not? In the cool of the day was Bible study. That's where they learned, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge. And they had Bible study every day in the cool of the day. I don't know about the cool of the day, huh? I'll, when I get there, I'll, I'll talk about it. This teaches the idea of the pre-incarnation, both visible and audible presence of the Lord God walking in the garden. We call this in theology an anthropomorphism, in other words, a human form or language of accommodation. It's also known as a Christophany, emphasizing the pre-incarnation appearance of Christ, the pre-incarnation, the pre-existence of Christ before his, his coming. You know, what was who was he in the Old Testament? Here he is. Well, let's, let's close with a word of prayer and we'll do a pledge and go get some lunch. Let's go get some lunch. Father, we're so thankful for the Word of God. It's the one treasure book we have. It predates earth. It predates man. And it'll be the book in heaven. The Bible. And won't that be a wonderful day when we sit down and see the big picture? Well, these are only snapshots we have in the Bible, just snapshots. As we move along in human history, won't that be something when we get to see it all played out and see how you put together the whole universe? And out of that chose this little planet called the Earth. And we'll get to see and understand the vastness of that decision. I mean, that in itself would be phenomenal. How we thank you, Father, for teaching us today and for a wonderful, wonderful congregation of learners. May we be up to the task every time, Father, to share the truth of the gospel, to be able to share the truth of what is behind the thing called the heavens and the earth and man upon it. I can tell you this journey would all be futile if not for a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I pray today, Father, we would understand the only way that can happen is through each of us understanding we must believe that Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give us life everlasting. We're thankful for it in Jesus' name. Amen.